All right, everybody, welcome to, yes, another episode of Behind the Visual with Mark Hansen, the podcast where I interview all those people responsible for creating the images and videos you see out in your world every single day. I am your host, advertising lifestyle photographer, Mark Hansen. And today, my guest is actor Stephen Kunkin. You might know Stephen from the show Billions, if you watch that. You may also know him from... The movies he's been in, such as Wolf of Wall Street and Bridge of Spies and the Barry Levinson directed movie Bay, plus lots of theater as well. So, man, this dude's done it all. He's a great guy. Love to talk to him. Had a great time talking to him. We're going to talk a little bit about what it was like working with um, Martin Scorsese, Leonardo DiCaprio, and Matthew McConaughey on Wolf of Wall Street. We're we'll also talk about what did Steven Spielberg do and say to him that really made him love Steven Spielberg even more than he already did when they were working on Bridge of Spies with Tom Hanks in a room where it was just uh, him, Tom Hanks, Steven Spielberg, and another actor. So great story there. And also, why did Barry Levinson put him in a room in his trailer for eight, maybe nine hours and not let him out. And then when he did, he was like, hey, go walk through this hospital that we have as our location set up. And here's a camera. You're going to run the camera as well and ad lib through the whole hospital of horrors, pretty much. So definitely a cool story. Lots of cool stories. I think you're going to love this one. Be sure and like it, thumbs up it, subscribe, comment, all that kind of stuff. Let me know what you think about it. And uh, we'll keep on doing it. So enjoy this one. Very cool. Um, I love your stuff. Is that a Mamiya sitting in the background there? Or is that a yeah, uh, Rolex? Yeah, I got a Mamiya, another Mamiya. I got a Hasselblad up there. Nice. Well, you see that. Yeah. So when did you start shooting? I've been shooting my whole life, actually. Yeah. Um, I started, you know, like the first, I had this, um, my first camera, I guess, was an AE1 program, you know, yeah. back in the, back in the day. Yep. Uh, I think it was like 11 or 12 years old. And, um, and I've kind of just, I've always been interested in the aesthetic of like the street, the street shooter, the grab yeah. and go kinds of shots. So like the Magnum kind of, I have, have had every Magnum book poured over that and I've had every posh point and shoot that I could afford all the way through. <laughs> through and, oh Yeah. Finally, I've landed where I've landed, but you have the Leica, don't you? I do. I have I keep a, a I, hashtag Leica on your Instagram. So I do. I, I I went on that stupid train back with an M <laughs> back with an M six some years ago, and I fell in love and uh, shot it in film for a while, and then I moved to I've had an M eight, an M nine, an M two forty, a Q, really Q two. Now I have a Q two. I sold the M two forty. I had a CL for like five seconds, which I did not like. Um, and then uh, now, I have, now I have an M9 and a Q2, which are- I've never old. shot with a Leica. I want to. Really? I'm yeah, shocked. I have, Your stuff's I've, sort of- Yeah. I don't know why I haven't bought one, but I've not bought one for some stupid reason. They're finicky and crazy expensive and they're just there, but they do, when you start loving on them, they're hard to like, they're a hard- yeah, well, maybe that's it. Well, hell, they're all lose. expensive now. I mean, every time I buy a new camera, I'm, it's costing me two to five grand, depending on which one I buy. And they're just in the, and they're just growing every single oh, yeah. iteration. It's just annoying. Like the Q2 compared to the Q now is, it's just insane because it's like what was it? The Q, which was a fantastic camera, it yeah, just, you know, had great rendering and and seemingly amazing resolution. You know, the Q2 now operates like 28 or 35 and a 50 because it's got so much resolution you can just like crop in um and you really i mean you're not getting the feel of those focal lengths but you're getting the crop at right, full yeah. resolution uh which is pretty insane like i can crop from a 28 to a 50 on the q2 and have way more resolution than i can have with like a 50 sumacron on an m9 full frame sensor really this is crazy but wow Damn. That and your that and your mortgage could yes. uh, you know yeah so. I'm shooting with a D810 right now and I tell most of my right. clients like you can crop in I'm like I'm gonna shoot it like wide wider and you can crop in 
and you'll be yeah. fine. Yeah, I know. Fine. So, I mean, like the great photographers I know who are like, who kind of snicker when I'm like, yeah, shoot with a Q or a Leica. And they're like, mm -hmm. they're like I'm shooting on my 5D Mark II. And that's plenty. And it's plenty. Nobody ever has asked me for anything else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Why not? If you can do it, do it. You know? Well, it's, you know, it's not, I mean, I, I think if I hadn't done, if I hadn't gone the route that I've gone, I would have maybe have been some kind of adjunct of this but uh you know it's such a pa it's a passion so it's like yeah. it's like being a guitarist if you're a guitarist and you're ever clapped and anything you pick up is going to sound amazing but when you're passionate about like when you're like when you're a, a weekend hobbyist or whatever i'm better i'm better than that but it, it's like uh you know the gear becomes a huge part of it it's fun that becomes a part of it for sure so I want to know a little bit about, all right, let's get over the, let's go through the like main quick question. What made you want to be an actor full-time? What got you into acting full-time? You know, I started when I was really young. My brother just he had done a bunch of shows in grade school and high school. And like, it sort of started just in that way that when you're a younger brother watching a sibling get a lot of attention and, yeah. and see like, you know, can I do, you know, if, it, if he had been a, a great football player or whatever, I probably would have gone a different way in life. Um, but I was just kind of like followed him in his footsteps. And I just loved how interested my family and everybody was in kind of uh, in coming to see me and the ritual of going to, to the shows. And, and I was fortunate because I happened to, to I, I was, I, I'm going to say like, I was big enough to to get like lead parts right away. And that sounds so odd, but it's like, I just had a kind of stage presence when I was young being a big kid that it was like, yeah, you're the lead. Cause you're, right. over, you're over 5'10", you're the lead. <laughs> if you're 5'6", you're not. Now it's worked yeah. against me in film and TV, but um, where they were being more diminutive is helpful. But, yeah, uh, right. um, but I sort of went into it that way. I kind of backed into it and just found more and more things that I loved about it. And I think I was probably in college when I decided that it was I, it was going to go from just something that was filling my time to something that I was going to really try to pursue and see if it was something that I could make a living at. I was sitting in a class and I just watched the hours. I was working on a project that was about design and um, designing for the theater. And I, in the it was just like this nexus of all these visual uh art that I loved, which sort of encompasses photography and thinking about character and it all came together. And I just looked up at the clock and the clock, the hands of the clock were just, oh wow. You know, and I was just yeah. like, well, I want to do something like this with my life where at the end of the day, it can be like time went fast, but it was time that I, I loved. And um, I've been fortunate enough to, you know, the, every actor has these huge chunks of time even the most successful actors have huge chunks of time where they're where they're in between things or downtime where you right. uh, where you like reassess what you've done and i've always felt like it was a it's kept me buoyant in a way and, and connected to the world and questioning that's been made it a great life choice what were you in what were you in college for what did you go into college to do? i went to uh i went to a place called tufts university which is yeah. outside of boston and i went thinking i was going to be a political science major okay um and i took like two classes in political science and i was just kind of i i i don't know what i thought it was going to be but it was not what it turned out to be i think i thought it was going to be um more about like civics and possibly ethics or, or, or about how, how law works. And then in the classes that I was taking early on were much more about like how groups of people were, were sort of motivated to do things by different ideologies. And it, and it felt really like, it felt like you were manipulating people and their emotions in a way that I was like, well, if I do, if I'd rather do that in a kind of pure artistic sense, then, then be doing it in, in search of kind of a power or uh, something else. It may have just been the way it hit me at that time, but yeah. I just was like, I'm out. This isn't, this is, this is not the right mix for me. So I then sort of 
slid into being a drama major. I was like a psych major and all these different, you know, versions of, of asking the same question about right. life. Like, why are we here? What are we doing? And then suddenly somebody's like, you should be in the play. I was, I was like, all right, I'm going to go be in a play. And then I <laughs> sort of found my way into the theater and never got out again. That's amazing. I saw, I saw something. Um, I was listening, looking up on some stuff on you. Did you go to Juilliard? I did. Yeah. I How was that? Right after, you know, it's a humongous experience. It's four years. So, you know, you, after, if you do it like I did, you can go to Juilliard right out of high school. Yeah. So you can, you can use it as college or you can use it as a kind of college program. Um, and I, I mean, as a kind of graduate program, right, yeah. which is what I did. So I had done four years of undergrad and then I kind of looked, and this sort of goes back to the thing I just said, where I was looking at the landscape of what it, life would be as an actor. And I knew that there was going to be these really tough times. And if I didn't moor myself in a kind of obligation to stay the course by having done a graduate program or really late in time, probably I would be moved into something else. I would right. be like, eh, you know what? I haven't had a job and I, maybe I'll, I'm going to go into advertising or some yeah. you know, other use of my creative life. And so I was like, I'm going to apply to grad schools. And I, and Juilliard was a, happened to be the one that I, I really wanted to go to. And I ended up there and um, it's a huge experience. I, when I went there, it was very different than it is now there. And I mean, I was surrounded by amazingly talented people, many of whom, or like household names and um but it was it was it was sort of started in this like this oh god it, it was sort of founded in this kind of brutal like brutal honesty and and we're gonna break you down and rebuild you in the idea of what a perfect american artist would be and and so a lot of the time at juilliard was basically like felt like for the first two years it was like boot camp which was all the things you were bad at and all the things that you needed to work on and all the regionalisms that were in your speech and how do we get rid of them so you can get to a kind of neutral. And I think if you didn't go to college or you weren't a certain age or you didn't have a certain sense of self, you just threw away all the things that made you unique. And I saw a lot of people do that and suddenly just go into a, like a kind of neutral gear and then find first and second and third gear only because they told you what they were. Whereas the better way to have done it was to find a neutral gear so that you knew when you wanted to move into the things that ultimately were unique and special about you, you knew you were in charge of that as opposed to it just being in charge of you. Right. So I didn't, I mean, I can't say that I, I didn't, I didn't enjoy the program. Yeah. Like um, I think the school has changed a lot and it's much more about like community and, um, and being kind to yourself as an artist. But when I was there, was it was I learned immeasurable things, and and I am in forever indebted to the, the people that taught me there. But it was like, yeah, I did it. I don't, I don't need to, don't need to go back. Right. <laughs> and hang out in those halls and smell that air. I don't, don't need to uh, do that. So, did you, did you start out doing theater? Like, did you come out of Juilliard and? go right into theater or were you yeah TV and commercial my, and all that kind of stuff well I, you know I, I did a couple of commercials and which I thought was really fun because I was still in like my third year at school and and I got a couple of commercials and um there were some a couple of regionals and then one like game board commercial and I thought they were great and I love being on a set and, but really the school was like propelling you to like get into theater right away so I was I was doing um, Shakespeare in the Park was my first job out of school, uh, oh, wow. and and I booked that while I was still in at Juilliard, and I was lucky. I've been, I've been not would have been really fortunate. At theater is such an amazing home, and it will always be my home. I grew up in on Long Island, and my parents used to take me into theater all the time when I was a kid. So my love of this as a as a as a profession really first started in theater and there's nothing like doing live theater for an actor. There's just not, cause it's, it's when the lights go down and then they come back up again, you are, you are kind of steering the ship in a way that every other art form is not like for an actor. If you're in film and, and TV, you know, you're in charge of what you put on the chip, right? but whether or not what comes off the chip and gets onto into the edit, into the timeline of the edit that is nothing to do with you 
Mm -hmm. um, and so, or even how it's filmed has nothing to do with it. It's just you're in charge of, of a performance that then can be ruined or not, or made better or whatever, based on how they put it together. And so theater is really a unique kind of experience to do. I still love it. And, you know, I, I feel so badly right now for people who in, in the theater who are, we're gonna be the last folks back. Oh in. yeah, oh, that's terrible. Okay, real quick, there's a, where's your mic sitting? Is it, it's here, is it bad? No, but every time it's, I think maybe that's it. Cause you're like when you're, I think when your hands hit, no, that's not making any sound, but when your hands, are you hitting your desk or something? Right there, that. Okay, I will, I will keep yeah. it away. Is it banging? Yeah. I, like, I can I turn down the, do you want me to turn down the gain a little bit on it? I just want to make sure I'm not. Oh, yeah. Is it like that? that? No. Oh, no, yeah. hold on. Let me, I want to move. But it's something about when you're hitting, I guess you're hitting your, your desk. It makes a big thump. I will try not to. I think it, I'm actually using this mic and I didn't realize it. And I was yeah. something in the desk. All right. So that's, I will. That's a little better okay. too. Even that. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So the theater thing, I can see it. Do you, when you do theater, do you do different, let's say a different take like every show or do you try and play it the same way pretty much every show? It's a, it's a really good question. Cause it's such a, it is a, it's definitely a, it's a fine line because your job as a theater artist is basically to make sure you are recreating it in a completely organic way every single performance through. But you also have a responsibility to the story and to your fellow actors who are trying to do that also. Right. So I know some people who need to feel like it's completely different every single night. Um, otherwise they feel like they're dead inside and the thing is inert and they can't go forward. But I think that's kind of, I think it's selfish in a way because then you are, people are crafting and all actors work differently and they're crafting their performance based on rhythm and what they're gonna get from you. And so you want to be generous by sending the ball to them in the same way that they are used to receiving it. You know, it's like playing baseball. Yeah. If you throw to first base in a completely different way, every single time, there's no, there's no chemistry that develops between your team. So you have to sort of ask yourself within the confines of what is going to affect other people where you can move. So you're asking yourself, hopefully every night, a set of questions that something may trigger you to go in a slightly different direction internally and sometimes that means that you yelled louder in the in the angry moment on, than on other nights but you can't you can't really change the entire framework of it right. um unless you're doing if you're doing a one-man show then then maybe but even then you're it's like light cues and where you stand and and you and you've if you're lucky which there are so many great directors who help kind of shape something and even though it feels great to you doesn't mean it's going when it's feeling great to you doesn't mean it's transmitting to an audience and you can't tell that so as you work on a play with a director a director is saying you know when you get explosive there we stop listening or if you're crying there and you're really self-involved i i have no way in right so that sometimes the things that feel great and feel like they're super organic are great for you but they don't serve the event they don't serve the audience they don't serve your fellow person so it's a fine line you have to uh, if you do the same performance every night without being open to any changes somebody coughing in the audience somebody coming in sick and you can't hear them and you know then you look like you're not in the moment and you're right. not in the moment because you're just on a you're on a the, like the roller coaster at disney world just going through the ride but if you're just going off whichever way you want you're also not serving it so it's kind of finding that balance yeah, I can see that. Yeah, because I always wondered that because I know when you're on a TV or commercial set or whatever, a movie set, you can do multiple takes. You can switch it up and try and figure out what's best. You can ad lib and that kind of thing. But I was wondering if everybody did that on on stage in the theater or not. So that explains that for sure. Not so much. Not so much. Or or if you do, you're, you're not working that often. Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Word gets out. Word gets out that you're, you're one of those. That, it's a little bit difficult to work yeah. with i see that did what was your first 
movie TV, like really exciting role that you got? You know, it's a, I had a really interesting one. My first one that I got really excited about was, I think it was my first year out of, out of Juilliard. And I got cast on this show called Spin City. Yeah. I don't know if you remember. Was, and uh, I was a total new jack in the business. And I, pl- and I booked a doctor, which I would end up, I end up, I've played a lot of doctors. Yeah. And um, I was Michael J. Fox's urologist. I mean, and it was a very sort of like, it was a really fun scene because basically he got a lot of great lines about me, like giving him a prostate exam right. too hard or whatever it was. <laughs> but um, what was what was really interesting about it was it was before uh, Michael J. Fox had kind of announced in any way that he had Parkinson's. Or, and, oh, yeah. and so they clearly knew when we were shooting this um, and I, I had no concept while, while we were doing it until a little bit later, but they were sort of rolling out this idea of, of a medical thing, you know, and having, and getting him to sort of begin to talk about it in the public sphere in a way that was really interesting. Um, and I think that might've been the first time, I mean, he goes in and I think I tell him he may or may not have cancer and we have to continue to look for it. And, you know, in and amongst all of these jokes is this sort of serious through line that ends up not going anywhere. But I remember thinking that that was a, a I think that year they announced that he had Parkinson's and they, that scene made it on a bunch of different like oh, wow. uh, events. And I just remember being, you know, sort of honored that I was, I was the first I was the first person in Scrubs who got to actually, you know, share a share a lens with him. And How was he to work with? Was that cool? He was awesome. Yeah, yeah. he was awesome. Um, I mean, he was super fun. I was I've been a huge fan of his since I was a little kid, and I watched like Family Ties and everything. Yeah. So I was really, really super excited to get to work with him, and he didn't disappoint. I mean, he's just that's also like I've never had the chance to do that again, which was live in front of a studio audience, which oh, yeah. They do. They just don't do that that much anymore, and yeah. that was super fun because I was. It was an area that I felt really comfortable in because it's like this weird hybrid of doing it in front of an audience, um, and also putting it on tape. I would think, yeah, I would think that'd be a great way to transition into that because you still got that yeah. audience, you still get that feedback immediately. I would think that would be kind. It's of interesting cool. though. I never knew until I did it that it was like I just assumed that you did it in the yeah. audience but like they 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 tell the audience they're like look you're going to see this three or four times your obligation since you're here is you've laughed hard when you saw it the first time you have to laugh the same way the <laughs> second third and fourth time and it's just really interesting you don't think about like the, the audience is like oh right well yeah i've seen this and now well, i gotta I laugh think about that part i've only been to, yeah. i haven't been to an actual tv show like that like a no taping or something you know i've been to a taping of what like Pat Sajak had a nighttime show for a minute where he was trying to compete with David Letterman, all those guys. I think it was something like that or Price is Right or whatever. Yeah. But yeah. To do something like that, I hadn't thought about the fact that you got to actually <laughs> laugh every time they do it at the same time. And you can, you know, sometimes you can hear it. If you, uh, it, it was funny. It's funny when you're, you know, when you know the tricks of the trade. I was watching a Modern Family episode last night with my daughter, who's like really just discovered that show, Modern Family. Yeah. And she was, and she's obsessed with it. And it's great. I, I didn't really watch it that when it was on the first time, but now binging it, it's just super fun to watch. And there was this scene where um, one of the characters is, is eating. And I was like, wait, stop, stop it, Naomi. Stop the thing. And I was like, go back, go back. And I made her go back. And I was like, all right, I'm going to teach you something <laughs> that you're going to, actors don't like to eat in takes. I was like, oh, they just, sure, it, yeah. because when you eat in the shot, Basically, a couple of things have to happen. One is the next take, somebody from food styling has to come out and put it all back for continuity and make the food exactly the way it was. The food is usually cold by the end of the day and it sucks. You also, if you just keep eating on the first day, you got to eat for the entire day. So actors, you know, find ways to like pretend. So I was like, watch this guy. And then we watched, I forget, I just lost his name, but there's this one character and he just, he moves his food around and then he literally takes a fork and he puts it in his mouth without any food on the fork whatsoever. <laughs> and he's eating like fake eating. I'm like, and you just, if it goes by in such a flash that you don't notice it, but when you're like, watch, watch, uh, Ed, oh God, the guy from Married with Children, Ed. Uh, yeah, Ed, um, 
Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Such, such a great actor. But it, it was yeah. a moment that I was like, I don't know why I remember that. his name. But um, yeah, I thought I'm. How old's your daughter? Eleven. Okay, she's she's younger than mine. But I have annoyed the living hell out of my children with stuff like that. <laughs> I'm like, wait, did you see yeah. that? Look at that. You know, that, Look at that. Like, wait, hold on, stop. Rewind that. Did you catch this? And then like, all right, stop. I finally it's got helpful. to the point where I stopped doing it during movies. <laughs> yeah, I have a tough time. I mean, but it is helpful if you like are, you know, my my daughter likes, she's interested in some horror movies. You know, I think she just thinks there's like a rite of passage to get to watch. Yeah. And sometimes I, it's helpful because you've, you can do it. If, if there's ever like the, I'm not going to sleep tonight, I'm really, nervous. that was way more severe than I thought it was. And you'd be like, all right, let's talk through how they did that effect that was so scary. And now you built a kind of language where you're like, you know, they had a guy come in, he had a prosthetic, it was not a big deal. And, you know. That's, that's least- one of the reasons I can watch horror movies is because the half the time I'm sitting there watching, I'm like, all right, how'd they do that? Where were they lighting yeah. that from? Where was the camera angle on this? And all that kind of stuff. So I'm no half paying question. attention to the scary part. <laughs> <laughs> so you've worked i mean you started out with with michael j fox and then so you've worked with some pretty decent people speaking of like wolf of wall street you got martin scorsese and in the same scene you got leonard Lin, leonardo i finally got that name out DiCaprio, yeah, you, got you got it DiCaprio. and matthew mcconaughey in the same scene what the hell was that like well i mean I, you know the the interesting thing about it that particular situation yes i got on that set i mean and with those guys they were just i was such a huge fan of both of those guys but we were all united by the fact that there was an even bigger son to sort of pray to which is was scorsese so it's you know and everybody is in awe and excited to work with that guy so it's like if whoever the king is, if you're like going to bow to the king in that one, it was, it was this, you know, absolute monolith of, of American cinema. And so we all kind of were nervous because we all wanted to do our best for, for Scorsese. And, and so it, it was easy to kind of forget that these other guys were also in and of themselves were just such, you know, incredible artists. Um, And, there has to, you know, there, I have been really lucky. I've gotten to work with some people who I, I just have admired for so long. And there's a choice I think you have to make. And I, I remember the times that I've made that choice that where it's like, you know, if I'm going to get into the major leagues and play with these people, I can't, I can't play and still be in awe of them at the same time. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of have to just say, yeah, you're an actor. I think you're awesome. And there are actors who, I, you know, who I've worked with who are not famous, who I think are awesome. And that just means that like, I'm going to, I'm going to expect that I'm going to do my best and it's going to be elevated because whatever I give you is going to come back at me in a way that it's just even. Yeah. I was going to say, does that raise your game? Cause I know, I was just talking to um, a friend of mine yesterday and I was talking about how I'm, I rarely get intimidated by anybody that I meet, no matter how big or whatever they are. Yeah. But when I'm around somebody that is, you know, at a higher level, I do, it does tend to make me bring my game up because I do get a little, I don't get nervous with them meeting them, but I get nervous doing my job in front of them a little bit. And I think it helps because cool. it raises that level of quality and of you know what i'm doing on my end by having them 100%. around well yeah. think about it. you play if you're going to play jordan i've watched and i've watched some like great basketball players go up you know when kobe played jordan yeah um and you watch like how on point he is for those games you know it's just it, it was just amazing because you either you rise to that challenge but you're still you still know that you you have to bring your a game you're still thinking about it in a way that is that is really on point and um yeah. but nerves are good nerves are nerves mean that you are there's something at stake and i, I think, think so that too. that you know it's i think that that part of you know, this whole thing about like you have to relax and there's nothing you step on stage and you're an open vessel it's like that isn't that doesn't always serve you 
because we live our lives with tension. We live our lives in a, in a especially as when you're an actor trying to figure out moments that a playwright or a writer would want to put on a page. If anybody just put like your massage class, it would be the most boring thing in the world. We <laughs> the moments that are interesting are the moments that involve tension and anger and fear and pain. And, and so you have to, you have to be able to work through those and, and, and enjoy working in that space, not be undone by it because it's a huge amount of fuel, like that oh, flight yeah. or flight instinct and all of that um, is really valuable. Yeah, I imagine I, that's, you know, I'm sorry, I just, no, go ahead. But, but I just imagine it's like, you know, when I, some of the great were photojournalists who really inspired me to like follow photography, like Kappas and, you know, and such were, it's like the adrenaline that those guys must have had to capture those critical moments that have been forever, you know, indelible in our minds. And I'm like, I would never have the guts to do that. But when you're going along and that, in those moments, those guys are just, flowing with the water and the power of the universe yeah i can't imagine doing the whole war photography thing i was telling somebody the other day that i know almost every job i do now i still get nervous before it even if i've done it a hundred times there are times where i'm going to the job and i'm still nervous and i think that's good because it means i haven't gotten to a point where i'm just like eh, whatever i'll phone it in well, I saw your work with, with the vice, our wonderful vice president. Did you, and I, and I read your, your story where you didn't know ahead of time that that was where the day was going. Did you yeah. feel differently in the prep? And then when you walked onto the set, like, did it change the way you were working? Yeah, it was. So when I walked up there, I was like, and I was nervous going into it, but I thought, well, I'm shooting mostly behind the scenes. I, was, I got a little nervous when I found out I was going to have a minute with her and I didn't, I couldn't bring any lights. So I had to use whatever lighting setup they had. So that made me nervous. I got a little calmer. For me, it's one of those things where when I show up, I'm nervous getting there. As soon as my finger hits the trigger on the camera, it all goes away and I'm in the zone. I'm in doing what I'm doing. And for her, it was one of those things where I figured out my lighting and all of that ahead of time before she, cause I was there like three hours before she ever arrived. So right. by the time she showed up, I pretty much knew what I needed to do. I had my D810 has got a little pop-up flash on it. So I literally got a napkin and put a diffuser over it right. and diffused it a little bit and then shot some with a little bit of their lighting, but they didn't move the lights for me. I had to just shoot. And so I threw that flash yeah. in, had a little bit of their lighting and it all came out. I ended up having about a minute and a half, two minutes with her instead of a minute. But yeah, that's amazing, right? Yeah. How fast you get when you have somebody incredible like that and they just put them on this. It's like, yeah, you got a minute. You got a minute. She was good. <laughs> I mean, she did everything. I, I wasn't nervous about, you know, it was one of those things where my wife said, oh my God, I'd be so nervous. Like, I, she's just somebody in front of the camera at this point. And I've got a shooter and my job is to get the best shot. So I was just like, I need you to move this way. I need you to do this. Her shirt was popping up. I was like, I need you to fix your shirt right here. So, you know, everybody's not seeing straight into your shirt kind of a thing, but yeah, it was a cool shoot. I, I was. That's why it's like being, you know, it, it's when your technique comes out. That's what yeah. you go to. And that's what you, you do all those other shoots for. I was and happy you, I answered the call on that one. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Those were great. Those were great shots. Great yeah. shots. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Um, so you've also worked with Spielberg and Tom Hanks. What's the, directing wise, Scorsese, Spielberg, difference? Um. They're both such masters of the field. Um, I'm trying to think what would be a good- How much taller that. Spielberg than Scorsese? Not that, not that much. Really? They're both sort of, yeah, they're both sort of like enormous presences in in small gift wrapping. Right. I'm at least every, <laughs> I'm, I'm, six, I'm six two, so everybody's yeah. sort of small. But um, I'm both actually really generous Two all right, here's two, here's here's two different things. They're sort of similar in a weird way. Incredibly prepared, um, incredibly kind, desirous of the best work from people, and and are clearly in a, have gotten themselves into a position where the people who are they're working with are all capable of excellence. So it, there isn't a kind of like, how did you get here? Who right. are you? Like there, anybody who's gonna even say one thing or hand a glass over is going to be somebody 
who, unless they've made a horrible mistake, they, is somebody that they're going to be excited to work with. And so I, they work at this level where, where it's like, how do we get the best out of the moment that I think we all think this is? Yeah. And um, there was one moment I, I remember watching during Wolf of Wall Street where they had worked at this incredibly elaborate crane shot in the office. And, and it was like, it, it was something about putting um, one of the orders in this scene where Leo puts in a, puts something in like a pneumatic tube and sends it up oh, and, yeah. and like, and puts a bid in somewhere else. And they had this incredibly elaborate, it goes from here and it was like a tracking show. It was very Scorsese, you know, that kind of movement, follow the thing into the thing. Into the, and they shot it and they were watching playback. And I remember him standing in front of the monitor and he was just kind of like, it's very nice. It's a good shot. It's, it's a very good shot. I like it. I like it. I like the shot. It's a good shot. And then he kept looking and he was like, what's special about the shot? There's nothing special about the shot. I mean, what is the story? Why is there a story to this shot? There's nothing. I mean, what is special? What, what needs to be here about this shot? Oh, wow. And they, and I was like, wow, that's amazing. Cause it looked technically so unbelievably great. And they tweaked something that made the shot about character. And it just was like, yeah, that's what the difference between being great and being a master. Um, and, and he, and I just, you know, he's just great that way. It just gives people freedom to, to, to work within the confines of, of their ideas. And Spielberg is the same way. Spielberg is just the kindest, nicest, most beautiful, you know, setups with incredible, his DP that he, with Jean Ushu was just, you know, you look through and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm in this shot. I can't believe I'm in this shot. Um, so they're, 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 I think those guys are actually closer on the spectrum than one would imagine they're they both are real technical masters and also incredibly sensitive to performance get amazing work out of their actors they're also both really capable editors in their own ways so they're they're thinking about the final product as they're oh, shooting yeah. um they're both auteurs i mean they're so they're those two guys are sort of similar way more so than some of the other you know folks I've gotten to work with who are considered amazing also, who you're like, are, they're paying more, more attention to one element or right. one different element. These, those guys were thinking holistically in a way that is like multi-dimensional chess. So since you started, you've been directing recently, right? Yeah. Aren't you you're directing something right now? Is that what you were saying? Tell me. Yeah, well, I, I directed my, I co-directed my first feature Gosh, it was almost probably three, three and a half years ago, but it's finally got distribution and, okay. and is now. Very cool. It just takes for a, for a long time. Yeah, and so now that's out. It's called Before, During, and After, and um, and that's now out. To take these things take a long time, especially when you don't have a huge studio behind you and you have to find your way to the light. Um, but yeah, I have a couple of projects now that are in in varying levels of pre production, and it's really exciting like that's to good. try to build something yeah very, did you learn what did you learn from working with spielberg and scorsese when it comes to your directing um other than everything you've already told me i guess well I, i'll tell you another i'll tell you another story you know it that uh that i thought was super valuable which is and it's something and, it, and it's piggybacks on something you said which is you know you get self-conscious about until you push the, the shutter button, like you're self-conscious when people are watching you set up and again, prepping, prepping that work. And yeah. that's really true as an actor who's making the move to being a director, because I think you're watched by all these other actors who you have of, and the, and the technical people who are like, who is this guy? Right. Does he know how to, does he know how to move a camera? Does he know how to make our day? Like, are we going to be in here till two o'clock in the morning? Um, all of these things that they're, they're watching to see how you handle it. And, um, and I think you have to prove your metal early on and prove a kind of flexibility and a kind of problem solving ability. Uh, and every department, I think, sort of tries you out. They, they run you around the block one time oh, early wow. on. You know, the actors are like, I don't, I don't agree with this. I don't know what you're going for here. Tell me about it. And you have to do that. <laughs> you know, the gaffers are like, I can't put it there. I just can't put it there. You know, so, and the DP is like, I don't know what you're, what are you trying to say? So every department takes you around the block once or twice. Um, and I had this amazing moment on, on Bridge of Spies with Steven Spielberg, which was he uh, 
we were, I was doing a scene with an actor with with Tom Hanks and this actor named Dakin Matthews, which was like this: these two lawyer, uh, two lawyers. Tom was a lawyer, and I was a lawyer, and and Dakin was this judge for the Supreme Court. And we were like going to go into the back chambers and try this, figure out how we were going to try this case, and um, and it wasn't a particularly difficult scene but how you stage something between three people in a room and yeah. still make it beautiful was hard and 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 spielberg was like okay um i'm gonna need i, I just want to use tom and steve and dakin in, in the room and everybody else can leave because i want to try to work out this scene with them so like a bunch of people left and the producer stayed in and john Ush, the dp stayed in and a couple other people stayed in. he's like no 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 i need everybody to leave so then everybody but john Ush left and he's like no 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 Everybody but the actors. <laughs> wow. so then everybody but the actors had left, and he turned to us and he was like, "Look, I, I he said I, I, I've thought about this scene a lot. I don't know exactly what I want it to be yet. So I thought maybe if if the four of us rehearsed the scene together a couple of times and we kind of like got it on its feet, then we'd figure out the best way to do it, and then I could show everybody else because I don't want to be embarrassed in front of everybody." Else. <laughs> now, that was wow. complete. Like it just gave us so much agency and like, "Oh, we'll help you. We'll do whatever you want." It's Steven Spielberg. He's filmed every right. amazing impossible. You know, I'm sure things in Private Ryan were harder than us uh, standing around the desk. But what it did do was it just kind of, it just seamlessly created this world where we would take a bullet for him because he just showed his, you know, he just showed his uh, his ability to be vulnerable in front of right. us and not be undone by it and not feel like that made him weak. It just made him seem like he was part of this artistic team. And so I, that was, to me, it was really important, which is you don't have to know everything because you can't. And if you're the person who pretends you know everything, you're not gonna ultimately, you're not gonna get other people to do their best because you're not creating space for them to step in and go, what about this? Or what about that? What about this? And then you might as well just be a guy who holds the camera and shoots everything yourself and acts in front of it and is just like a one man band. And to me, that as a director, it's really about creating a community of people all working at their highest level. And so that, that to me is like one of the great lessons that I learned. Do you like directing as much or more than acting? Um, I feel like more of my entire presence is used in it yeah. you know i feel like there's something about it and you know where it's i have to work on the days go by way faster well, I bet. Um, you know you sort of are like wow where did the time go um just because everybody's always asking me something you're involved in every decision yeah, you don't have any made. downtime i wouldn't think you don't have any downtime um and it's sort of strangely lonely everybody's asking you about a million things but at the same time you're you're not you're not in anybody's team yeah you're just the, bo you're just the boss so it is a kind of a lonely thing but it is also it's it's you just it's just so all-encompassing that when it when you get to watch the experience in hindsight it's you're like you you are proud of it in a way that like i've never been of anything that i've done as an, as an actor. Do you want to, would you be willing to do like the directing and acting at the same time kind of deal? Um, sure. How difficult is that, do you think? I think it's, I think it's, it's less difficult, honestly, than I thought it was originally. Yeah. Like I did, I do play a small part in the, in the movie that it's very small parts, one scene. And it's just, it, it becomes like, you know, sort of know what you need the thing to be because yeah. you're thinking of what this, how the scene has to operate in the movie. And so it, it is, it, in some ways, if you cast yourself well, you know, if you know yourself and you know what you can deliver, it didn't, it wasn't impossible because you could basically go like, you do it, you go back behind the monitor and you do playback. All right, let's do it again. But I want to do, I want to do something different. Right. And, it, and it's not, I, I think there are some actors who hate watching themselves because yeah. they, they just, they want to never hear it. I know actors who are like, if you, if I hear you doing the playback, I'm going to kill you. Um, and 
Okay. That isn't me. I, I find it really interesting. And I think I learn a lot by watching what I did and, and just tweaking it little by little. Yeah, I would um, think you would. So yeah. I think I I mean I wouldn't want to be I wouldn't want to be in every frame of a frame of a movie. That would I think that would be so hard. But if I had to do one or two scenes or or play a, a, a small arc and something, I think it's doable. Right. Yeah, I would think that whole being the lead character and directing would be a little annoying or difficult. For sure. I think of like Dances with Wolves and what he had to do in yeah. Dances with Wolves. And like, yeah, I don't know how the hell yeah, you pulled that one off. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, we don't have a lot of time left, but let's talk about billions. Have you guys started sure. shooting again? Uh, I think they, ha I think today, I think today okay. they are back. I'm not back for a little while. Um, but uh, yeah, they're, they're doing an amazing job because we shut down last season we had finished eight and i think we're just getting into episode nine and when the when the world sort of shut down um and now so we've gone back we're good we have to complete whichever i think it was we have to complete episode nine and then do 10 11 and 12. oh wow um, and that's uh and so we're just getting into that now they've had they've done this incredible work our producers and and the network showtime have done this incredible job at building a safe environment for us all and so there's like these crazy uh covid cadences that we're in and we're tested three times a week and then the week before the day you shoot you are there on the set you're getting a rapid test in your dressing room you can't report to this i mean it's it's amazing like it looks our set looks like all the fun things that were on our set that were like, this is where you got the omelet in the morning and got your gummy bears in the afternoon. I've been right. replaced by like people in hazmat suits and <laughs> swabs sticking up your nose. So it's slightly different uh, experience going to work, but it's it, it's definitely feels like people are paying really close attention to our health and safety, which is well, that's good. Of course, the most important. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's great to hear. So we're gonna be shoot. We're gonna shoot straight through. I think until next December. Is the, is wow because we're going to shoot the rest of this season and then move directly into the next season okay damn season six do you know how many episodes you're going to be in the next season and a half already i mean i i know we know as far as up till five which okay. is to this and i think then i think they're trying to separate out in people's minds what that is so yeah, well that makes sense um, i could tell you but I'd, I'd have to shoot you okay all right <laughs> i actually don't know i don't really know um if you know please tell me i, I don't have a here. clue man i just i do enjoy seeing you when you show up on screen though i tell you because i always think well, oh here comes spirit you. this is going to be interesting as hell <laughs> he, he's a very he's a very particular flavor that people you know i find that people either are like, oh, there he is. Or they're like, I can't stand coriander. Don't put coriander in my food ever. <laughs> That's like the way I think some people feel about it. I have to Spirit. say, he's a, uh, it's been an evolution for me because when the character first started, I was like, this dude's just annoying as hell. Yeah. And now I'm kind of like, all right, this dude's quirky and I'm digging it now. So let's see a little bit more of what comes out of his mouth or what he does or whatever. So it's, it's, you know, it's not easy being, you know, that smart and that <laughs> It's very difficult. It's hard, is there anything it's of Spira that's you? Or is it all just like totally? Uh, yeah, totally. I mean, look, Spira wants to be liked. He really desperately wants to be liked and to be admired by people around him. He's just terrible at doing it. Right. He just, he just, it's just the guy who who's desperate to be like the center of attention. And he would be so much better if he just didn't ask for it. If he yeah. just because he's he's not an uninteresting human being he's just he's just bad at at you know oh yeah I've worked with some he people thinks like the that. lights on him yeah me too yeah um so sure I mean I think there's definitely and I think he also I'd like the way Spiros is uh doesn't take no for an answer most yeah. of the time I think he's just <laughs> I think there's a bit of that in me too um Certainly the coffee. I'm definitely, we're, we, we share our coffee. Okay. Very, very well, that's good. I guess awesome I don't coffee. drink coffee, so I don't really know much about it. I actually drank a oh. cup of coffee last weekend. We were on, we were um, visiting some friends who have a mountain house at a ski slope, and we went to see them. And my friend Jason made some coffee, 
and my wife had it and I tasted it. It's like, that's not bad. I was like, maybe when she looked at me, like I had like horns growing out of my head all of a sudden, because we've been married almost 23 years. She's never seen me drink coffee because I just don't drink it. That's but hilarious. It's actually pretty good. Whatever he if did. Good coffee but, is pretty, it's, it's nothing like it. I like the way it smells. But so yeah. you clearly haven't had COVID. If you did, you, uh, <laughs> that's true. I talked to my stepbrother yesterday who had COVID. And I was like, "Did you lose your sense of smell and taste?" He's like, "Yeah." And he said, "And I still don't have all my sense of smell back." He said, "But the weird thing is, is I can't smell bad things. Like if somebody rips one and it's awful, I can't smell it." They said, "My wife like will yell super, at me." It's like a superpower. Yeah, it's going to create a whole group like of people be like. That's amazing. Yeah. It's like a whole vocation of people be like, man, I might as well be a garbage man now. Like, no, it's not exactly. me. so he's like, okay. All right. I know we only got a few more minutes left. So I'm going to ask Fine. you, um, sure. What's this? Okay. I always say, what's your strangest, most interesting thing that's ever happened to you? I actually did this one of these podcasts the other day where we flipped it and I was being interviewed by the other person and Somebody else has said it before. It all comes down to like your experiences, what you think is strange or interesting. If it's an everyday thing for you, then it's not as interesting or not as strange to you as it might be to every other person in the world. So I'm kind of switching it up. You're the first person. What's the strangest, most interesting or best story you have about something that's happened to you since you've been in this business? In the business. Okay. Yeah. That, that helps define it. Um, if you want to go outside of it, because there's something even better. <laughs> no, I'm going to think ahead. that's it. It's, it's strange. Hmm. It's a really good question. Um, it's going to be hard to come up with, with one, I think, that's that satisfies that. I, you know what? It'll be the one of the ones that tonight I'm like, yeah, that's it. That is, why didn't I say that? Um, This is, I mean, this is the first thing that pops in my head is like, uh, I did a, one of the most unique and, and I'll say fun experiences I had was working on this. There's a director named Barry Levinson, who's yeah. another, you know, luminary. And I got to do a horror movie that he, uh, that he directed called The Bay. And it was about like, uh, it's interesting now in light of COVID, but this was way before that. Um, it's about like if this this microorganism that actually exists in fish now called an isopod, where it, it, what it does is it, it lodges itself in the tongue of the fish that it's in. And then it basically sits and eats the fish, eats what the fish is eating until it can't get enough food. And then it turns around and eats the the fish that it's host oh and it's like and then it would be in this movie is about what would happen if this thing called the isopod were to make the jump into man and so and then there's this town in you know just off the chesapeake where the water supply gets infiltrated by these isopods and then this whole community just gets oh no I, I played the like the head of the emergency room at uh, ground zero of this event and i remember i was so excited because i loved barry levinson i loved his movies and i was really excited to work on this movie and I was down there to film this one scene which was basically because there's a lot of found footage in the movie you know it's a, one of these like movies where it's like you know do you use the security cam do you use the oh, cell phone yeah. cam um, and in this one particular scene he, I said he put me in my trailer for like eight or eight or nine hours and he was like I'm just I'm working on something I'll call you out when when we're ready it's like, all right. So I sat in there all day. And then finally, like it started to become nighttime. And he goes, all right, come out. He's like, you're, you're a cameraman, right? You've, you've worked with a, you, I forget how he knew, but I was like, yeah, I was like, I've, I've held a camera for him, photographer. He's like, all right, so I'm going to give you a camera and I want you to be your character. And I want you to walk around the hospital because it was a shutdown hospital that we were using as this set. He's like, and I've spent eight hours putting stuff in the hospital for you to find. Um, <laughs> and, and I want you to narrate as the doctor and, sh and shoot what you see. And I was like, okay. Wow. And so it was like now nighttime and it was basically me with a camera pretending I was this character walking through the halls of this hospital, which were all the lights were off and they had those like emergency yellow sirens that were the only yeah. things lighting it up. And 
I got to walk around this fun house that was with that they he and the props department and the art department had turned into an absolute grisly, you know, scene of devastation. And I walked by just people with no heads and I'd walk into the bathroom and there'd be 10, eight, 10 people dead there with blood oh spattered. And it was, it was absolutely crazy. And it was just so exciting because you never get to do that as an actor. You never get to like just completely improv yeah. and be so surprised and have no idea. And also it was basic, you know, I got to hold the camera too. So it was like, you know, I was like, here's a whip pen for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was very proud. I was probably prouder of my camera work than I was of the performance. But um, but I remember thinking Did you get when cameraman I got credit for that as well. I got no, I got no. <laughs> That's really lame. lame. Yeah. And, and I managed. I did one terrible shot where I like caught my own bald spot in a reflection of a mirror. I was like, <laughs> really? You couldn't have helped yourself out. You couldn't. You're gonna have <laughs> gone low. You had to like find the reflection up here. It's stupid. Uh, no that was I mean I'm sure I have a million other better stories but I just that has always stuck with me as like one of those ones where you just you couldn't believe you're working with this guy and then you really couldn't believe you got to work with this guy in this way um, amazing and it was just awesome it was just really cool it shows a lot of trust on his part as well yeah, yeah totally yeah totally well man thank you thank you so much for doing sure. this. hey this was so <laughs> awesome yeah, I enjoyed it. I'd love to get back and do it again and maybe talk a little more about photography and some other stuff. I'd love that. Yeah, I'd love point. that. I'll be, I'm going to grill you. And if that happens, hey, it's, man, be a lot. it's going the other way. I'd be all for it. That'd be cool. Awesome. Well, thank you awesome. again. And you uh, so nice meeting you. Yeah, nice meeting you too.